Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Sunday morning Bible study in Ecclesiastes. It's so great to be back with you again. I do appreciate uh, your continued prayers. It's uh, not been a good long week for me, and uh, we've tried to do this recording a couple of times now, but we'll get through it together as we uh, continue to study God's Word. It's, it's worth uh, studying God's Word together. So today we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We're looking at verses 1 through 10. We're tackling the question, facing death? We've uh, looked at a couple of, of several different questions as we got as we started into Ecclesiastes, as the teacher has uh, talked about some of these big questions of life, and we've tackled uh, what the Bible has to say about those. But one of the main things that we talk about, even especially today, I think about loved ones that we've lost recently and people that we know, especially I know many of us, I'm sure many of us know of people uh, who have uh, lost loved ones during this time. Perhaps you have as well. But there's one thing that we all know, we all must face at one time or another, death is the great equalizer. No matter how rich you are, no matter how poor you are, no matter how strong you are, no matter how weak you are, we all must face death. And then when we start to contemplate that, we come to the, to the realization that we don't know how many days we have on this earth. We do know in our previous studies that God has given us a certain number of days and that he's numbered those days. And only God knows how many days we've been given. All that, all that being true, and we know that's true, we also know, and we come to realize as we study the Bible, that we are responsible for how we live out the days that we've been given and how we steward the resources that God has given us during the days that we have here on the earth. There are times when we may suffer, and there are times when we will experience great blessings. All these times, the suffering times, the blessing times, they're all part of the ebb and flow of life. No matter how long a person lives, that person is going to die unless the Lord returns first. Ecclesiastes 9, 1 through 10 addresses this reality and also how we live in light of our mortality as human beings. So in order to understand the focal passage for today, let's talk about the context, the wrapper that wraps around the front end and the back end of this passage today. So in, in when we look at the context of Ecclesiastes 9.1 through chapter 10 and verse 20, we see that Solomon continues on in his exploration of the things that he calls life under the sun. Part of this reality of life under the sun, it includes how unpredictable that life truly is and how certain death is. These truths are difficult to come to terms with because all humans long for some sense of control. We all want to have some kind of control in our life. But Solomon reminds us that no human can know with any certainty what each day will bring, or even when death will occur. <clears throat> this is part of being human. God is the only one who holds these truths in his hands. These truths are hidden. They are hidden in the mystery of God's will. So once again, the teacher in Ecclesiastes confronts us with the limits of human power and the limits of human knowledge. And we see that in Ecclesiastes 9, verses 1 and 2. Solomon makes it clear that difficulties will come in each person's life, regardless of whether that person is a righteous person or a wicked person. Trials are no respecter of persons. Sometimes the wicked live a relatively blessed life from an earthly perspective, and sometimes the righteous, on the other hand, suffer in a way that even boggles the mind. Consider Job, for instance. Regardless of all this uncertainty 
And regardless of how unfair this may seem, the righteous person can live in assurance that their life, in a way, makes the best use of time. Living with an awareness that his life is in the hands of God and that his life being in the hands of God makes the best use of his time, that his life is, is best used when he enjoys the good gifts of God and when he lives in a way that makes the best use of the days that God's given him, then that, that truth, living in that awareness, is the true application of what the teacher in Ecclesiastes calls wisdom. But living without acknowledging these truths is what the teacher says is foolishness. So pursuing a wise life has benefits in and of itself. The contrast between wisdom and foolishness is the theme of this section of the book. Wisdom is explored in several places there in Ecclesiastes, and we've already hit several of them even along the way. Folly is also explored extensively in Ecclesiastes. And in this section alone, there are several different verses that deal with both sides of those when we look at the context from Ecclesiastes 9.1 to 10.20. This section then gives us practical advice for living our day-to-day -day lives. Solomon even goes on to explain that the poor can possess wisdom while the privileged can exhibit folly. That tells us that one's opportunities or resources do not guarantee wisdom, nor do they guarantee foolishness. No one is doomed to foolishness, and no one is guaranteed wisdom. The way that one lives their life, regardless of the circumstances, demonstrates what category they fall into, wise or foolish. For this reason, wisdom can achieve greatness and can surpass many earthly gifts. We could summarize this entire section with the idea that regardless of the life you are given, all people are destined to die and be judged. This truth alone can be a great motivation for making wise choices in life and living as one who possesses true wisdom. So now let's explore the text together. If you have your Bible open, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. If you're using an electric, electronic Bible, scroll on over to Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and we'll start with verses 1 through 3. Verse 1. So I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But no one knows whether love or hate awaits them. All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good, so with the sinful. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. Verse 3, this is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterward they join the dead. We have already seen, and we are reminded again, that both the righteous and the unrighteous have the same fate, death. According to Solomon, there is one fate for everyone. Each one of us is closer to the point of death than we were yesterday. In verse 1, the teacher referred to all that we've learned so far in our study of Ecclesiastes up to this point by saying all this. He said, I reflected on all this there in verse 1. For Solomon, this was not just an intellectual reflection of some sort. He was deeply involved 
in what he was about to share. So first he noted that the, the righteous and the wise are in God's hands. To refer to all things being in God's hands reminds us of God's absolute sovereignty over all things. Just like we read in Proverbs 21 and verse 1, even the hearts of kings of the earth are in his hands. Therefore, the outcome of everyone's life, including both the righteous and the wise, rests in God's control. The implication of this truth are vast in their implications. Essentially, God knows the big picture of what we do not know. From a purely human perspective, no one knows whether being in God's hands means that blessing or judgment lies ahead. This is how we might read Solomon's use of the words love and hate. This is the one of most intense and transparent passages that we find in the entire book of Ecclesiastes. There seems to be a deep struggle here on the part of Solomon. From his limited perspective, he could not see what the future holds, love or hate, from God. Moreover, we do not know why God allows and even sometimes even ordains certain things to happen in our lives. But one thing we do know is that death is certain for all people. While Solomon did not know whether days of love or hate were ahead of him, he did know that death was ahead for him and for everyone else as well. So regardless whether one is righteous or wicked, whether they will face love or hate, whether they are clean or unclean, he says, whether they make sacrifices to God or not, even whether or not they make vows, they cannot escape the certainty of death. Death is the fate of all, regardless of one's ethics and regardless of one's worship. In this sense, the teacher despaired of death as an evil necessity, even as an enemy of the world. Death is necessary because, as Solomon said in chapter 9 and verse 3 there, the hearts of men are evil. And now that's a very interesting thing to, to point out there. The hearts of men are evil. And Jeremiah even went on to say that it was dark and it was corrupt and who can understand it? You know, so many times a day you hear people say the heart wants what the heart wants. Well, don't follow your heart because it will lead you astray. Follow God's spirit and follow God's word. That's the only way that you'll make the right decisions. If you follow your heart, uh, your heart will lead you in ways that are not the best for you. The heart is wicked. It's evil above all. In the end, the point to this section is clear. All people will die regardless of their level of human righteousness and regardless of their level of human wickedness. Therefore, all people must be prepared for death. But understanding this reality can help us live our lives with wisdom. The first step in living wisely is knowing how to live in light of coming death. Knowing that we will eventually die reminds us that we are not God. We are, them. We are people who are mortal. Our days are like a vapor, the Bible tells us. We're here today, we're gone tomorrow. But God has dominion over us, and ultimately we will answer to him, creation to creator. Now let's look at Ecclesiastes 9, verses 4 through 6. Next we see, seek life. Chapter 9 and verse 4. Verse 4, anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. Uh, we all love our little doggies. Uh, many of y'all who know us know that we have a little Maggie running around the house. She's not too little. She's a black lab. But, uh, but uh, we all love our little animals. We love our dogs. But in the ancient Near East, 
a dog was not considered a pet, nor were they kept as pets, but rather they were looked upon as large scavengers. Dogs were associated with contempt. Goliath even expressed this when he asked David, Am I a dog that you, that you come at me with sticks? When he talked to David in 1 Samuel 17, 43. The lion, on the other hand, was admired as the king of the animal world. Lions were the icons of royalty. For example, Jacob used the metaphor of a lion to describe the coming Messiah in Genesis 49 and verse 9. Solomon concluded that a despised, contemptible dog that is alive is better off than a regal, royal, respected lion who is dead. Even if the lion was the mightiest and most majestic of the entire animal kingdom. <coughs> this is a very stark way for Solomon to remind us that to be alive is to have opportunity that's not available to the dead. This is a point that he explored previously in Ecclesiastes 6, 1 through 6, where he asserted this idea that there is advantage in being alive rather than in being dead. One of the advantages is that you know you will die. Therefore, you can live your life with this knowledge ever before you and be prepared for it when it comes. Because once you're dead, it is too late to direct the path of your life and to prepare yourself and your loved ones and your estate for your passing. Our days are fleeting, and therefore we have to assess how to live well today in order to die well tomorrow. Now let's look at verses 5 through 6. Verse 5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Solomon states that when it comes to the dead, their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. There's no longer a portion for them in all that is done under the sun. He asserts then that in light of the certainty of physical death, that God's people should realize the preciousness of life. While alive, there is hope of finding purpose and reward. There is wisdom in letting go of the things that embitter us in the days that we have on the earth. Keep in mind that Solomon did not have a fully developed understanding of the eternal fate that is explained to us who are stewards of the gospel in the church age of the New Testament. When Solomon wrote, the same destiny overtakes us all in verse 3, he was primarily concerned with physical death, not the concepts of heaven or hell. As Christians, we have a more fully developed understanding and revelation from the Holy Spirit and from God's words of the rewards that await those who have their righteousness in Christ. Because of this, we can live with hope, we can live with purpose knowing that Christ defeated death through his resurrection. This means that death does not have the last word. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. Death does not have the last word. Even still, it reminds us that how we live before we die matters to God. That's where we come into Ecclesiastes 9, 7 through 10, where he says, Enjoy. Enjoy. Let's look at verses 7 through 8. Verse 7. Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart. For God has already approved what you do. Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your head with oil. Several times already the teacher 
has exhorted his readers to enjoy life. In verses 7 through 10, he elaborates again on why and how one should enjoy life. And he will do so one more time in chapter 11, verses 7 through 10. Repetition is a common way in the Near Eastern uh, method of teaching and philosophy and also of writing that they would emphasize a point. And Solomon's repeated message to enjoy life demands our attention. It's so important that we take time. Have you ever heard somebody say, take time to smell the roses? <laughs> it's a, take time to enjoy the beauty and the gifts that God has given you today so you can rejoice and follow him better today and tomorrow. In many ways here, verse 7 is the heart of the message of Ecclesiastes. He says, Go eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. Have you ever wondered why the gospel writers included the saying many times where they said Jesus came eating and drinking? They said he came eating and drinking. Breaking bread together was a sign of enjoying other, each other's company and intimate fellowship. It was, uh, very, it was, it had a lot of ceremony to it. And, and part of their culture was when you broke bread with someone, that was a very intimate thing to do. Wine also in their culture was a common item of fellowship. In some cultures, it may be tea time or grabbing a cup of coffee with a friend. God has not only created us to need food and drink, but he's also created us to enjoy a vast kind and variety of food and drink for our enjoyment. And that differs from culture to culture. I want to emphasize here, God is not, and the Bible is not advocating drinking wine here for everyone. He's not saying, if you're going to enjoy life, you need to drink wine. That's not the point. He's not saying if you're going to enjoy life, you're going to have to eat food. What about people who can't eat solid food? They have some kind of a, of a disorder and they can only use NG tubes or G tubes to, to get their nourishment. Does that mean they can't enjoy life? No, of course not. What he's saying here is take the time to do what they did back in the day where they broke bread and they had their food and their drink together with others and they enjoyed intimate fellowship and they enjoyed and they did life together. That's the point of this passage. Not to say go out and drink alcohol, but rather get together and enjoy fellowship with each other. In verse 8, Solomon continues to build on the idea of joying life with the words, Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your head with oil. In ancient times, when people were distraught, they wore sackcloth and ashes to demonstrate their grief. On the other hand, white clothes reflected the heat of the sun, and oil protected and nourished the skin. Likewise, oil also symbolized joy. In our time, it would be the equivalent of wearing bright and fun clothes and living life with a smile on your face and a spring in your step. The teacher was saying here to be clothed or covered in joy at all times and be so clothed with joy that your joy is apparent to others. Now let's look at verses 9 through 10. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead where you're going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. In verse 9 here, Solomon instructs men to enjoy life with their wives. But the principle here applies to both married men and women. To enjoy women, your husbands, men, your wives, until the day that you die. Because we know that marriage is a blessing from God for the mutual enjoyment of both the man and the woman. And couples can only enjoy it in this, what he calls, meaningless life, because there will be no institution of marriage in heaven as we know it on earth. 
Jesus addressed that question in Matthew 22 and verse 30. So when a married couple in, loves and enjoys each other as God intended, they will experience a wonderful blessing here on the earth, and they will do something that God intended for, for us to do. He created us in his image, and as his image bearers, we get to take part in seeing more image bearers brought into the world through marriage and through our procreation. Enjoying life also includes whatever your hand finds to do. This certainly pertains to one's occupation, but it also more generally speaks to whatever a person is able to do. The Hebrew word that's translated whatever literally means all or everything. So the phrase do it with all your might means that when you work, when you get into a job or you get into a career or you get into a, some, a, a, some kind of a project, work at it as, as given it everything that you have. The New Testament says work into all things as if you were doing them unto the Lord. We should give our very best effort to everything that God allows us to do. When's the last time that you looked at your job, when you looked at your career, when you looked at work that you had to do as being a blessing from God? Work is a blessing from God. It's fulfilling the mandate that he gave us to work and to, and to be fruitful and to do the things that he set out for us to do. We should give it our best effort because God has allowed us to do it, and it's a privilege. Why? Because when a person dies and goes to the place of the dead, there will be no more opportunities this life on earth affords. Earthly opportunities are over at that point. Solomon was exhorting us to enjoy the things of the world properly to the glory of God. Within the Christian tradition, there's been a tendency to equate true spirituality with shunning the good things of creation rather than enjoying them. And that's not what Solomon says here. Instead of shunning things that are good, that are under the creation, under the hand of God, that are our God-given purpose, we then may fall into self-righteous legalism. And that's a very big danger when we start to reject certain things uh, that are good that God has given us from above. On the other hand, there is the fleshly tendency to dive headlong into good things and to make those good things of the earth, those good things of the world, the ultimate things in life. Those who abandon themselves to food and drink, to pursuing the good things in life, do so because they assume that that's all there is before they die. So they engage in a life of selfish pursuits and outright self-indulgence. In both cases, these approaches are unbalanced. When we look to ourselves or created things, rather than the creator to find ultimate satisfaction, we become chained, we become locked in, we become narrowed in to a path that only leads to despair, disappointment, and ultimately destruction. These two approaches, though, are very common because sin fractures and distorts everything. When it comes to God's good gifts, we must remember that sin does not uncreate everything because good things are God's creation. We cannot reject them as evil. Because we are God's people, we must not use God's good gifts in evil ways. God gives us good gifts to show us his favor. But because those good gifts do not ultimately satisfy our hearts. They are simply tools that make us aware of his goodness and make us even more homesick for heaven, where unstained joys await us for all eternity. We may pass through this world and enjoy all that it has to offer if we remember 
that the final delight of being with God will totally overwhelm whatever joys and whatever delights this world has to offer. There's nothing like heaven. There's nothing that we've seen here. There's nothing that we've heard here. There's nothing that we've felt here. There's nothing that we've experienced here that can ever compare to heaven. Verse 11 says literally, time and happenings happen to all. Situations arise. Circumstances change. Unforeseen events occur. This is why the teacher encouraged us to put our faith in something that is not under the sun because unforeseen things happen and these things might change our best laid plans. Because as he says in chapter 9 verse 12, we do not know our time. This is not unlike the words of James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Listen to what James says in James 4, verses 13 through 15. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Understanding this principle is the key to a life that is well lived. If we do not know when we will die, then we must live now while we can and make the most of our time now. If we have a chance to do something for the glory of God, then let us do it now because we do not know what the future will bring. We as believers should not worry our way through life, but rather enjoy our way through life. For we have joy that's unspeakable and full of glory as we walk hand in hand with our Lord and Savior through this life. We cannot waste away our days with meaningless pursuits by holding grudges, engaging in arguments, letting frustrations get the best of us, letting our anger get away from us, letting our worries drag us down, or anything else that would distract us from the ultimate things, from the things that have spiritual and heavenly and eternal significance. Life is too short for that. And because life is short, let us enjoy and let us use the days that God gives us to the fullest, making the most of our lives, making the most of every day for Christ's glory. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm so glad to be able to share this time with you today. And hopefully my voice wasn't too raspy. Uh, but I, I do appreciate you hanging with me on it and appreciate your continued prayers. Uh, looks like we are back together in service on Sunday. We're praising the Lord for that. So uh, Lord willing, we'll see you a Sunday morning. And if you're not able to make it in person, do join us online. And uh, don't forget to type into to the chat there so we can interact with you and, and see you and hear from you and get your insights uh, both during the Bible study and also during the worship service. May God bless this study today to your heart as he has to mind that he might draw us closer to him and that we might serve him better today while it's still today. Make the most of it. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day and a blessed week. Till next time.